Hey, it's NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbong. On NPR's Books We Love, our collection of 300 plus of our favorite reads this year, you can mess around with the filter tags to narrow down the stuff you or someone you love might want to read. For instance, if you wanted to read a biography slash memoir that's also a graphic novel, that's also about family, and that's also an NPR staff pick, well, we've got a few options for you, and we're going to tell you about two of them today. In a bit, we'll hear from a famous magazine artist and his story about his family fleeing Cuba. But first, Pulitzer Prize-winning cartoonist Darren Bell's memoir, The Talk, is about the lesson Black kids receive about how Black people are seen in the world and the very real dangers of living in a racist society. And Bell tells Empire's Aisha Roscoe that it was actually his white mother who gave him this talk, not his Black father. And there's a moment in this interview where you can really hear him empathize with his father now that he's a dad himself. That's after the break. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Doctors Without Borders. When people are in crisis, there's no time to lose. Every day, Doctors Without Borders teams are providing emergency medical care and supplies to people caught in the crossfire of war and conflict, treating injured patients in the aftermath of earthquakes and floods, and responding to disease outbreaks and rising malnutrition. This Giving Week, help Doctors Without Borders deliver life-saving care. Learn more at doctorswithoutborders.org slash NPR. Three years ago, Pulitzer Prize-winning editorial cartoonist Darren Bell was at work on a biography about his grandfather. Then came the summer of 2020 and those massive Black Lives Matter protests against police brutality. Bell had a long talk with his editor about changing the subject of the book entirely and happened to mention something. I'm having to grapple with whether my six-year-old son is old enough for the talk. I wasn't planning on giving it to him for a couple years. The talk, as in the talk Black parents give their children about how the world will not be kind to them because of the color of their skin. I mean, you look at your children and, and you see innocence and, and they're precious and, you, and they still believe in magic and they still believe that the world loves them. And you don't want to take any of that from them. But at some point you have to if you want to prepare them for what's to come, if you don't want someone else to take it from them in a, in a much worse way. And I told her, you know, it was ironic that he's the same, he was the same age, six years old, that I was when my mom gave me the talk. And, you know, she replied with, with three words. She just said, that's the book. Darren Bell stopped working on the biography and instead created a graphic novel about his own life called The Talk. Bell, who's also known for his Canderville syndicated comic strip, joined us last week. I asked him about a time in the book when he describes his mom first giving him The Talk. I asked for a water gun and she said no and she she told me why. She said that the world is different for black boys and girls than it is for white ones and You know, I might see my white friends running around with water guns carefree because when police see them, they just see pure innocence. They see little kids playing. But when they see me, they might see a threat. They might think I'm older than I actually am. You know, I might even get shot. Now, I didn't believe this at all. This made no sense to me. So as soon as I could, I snuck out of the house with with my bright green translucent water gun shooting random things, imagining that they were stormtroopers and that I was Luke Skywalker escaping from the Death Star. And, you know, I bent down to to load, to load reload the water gun in a puddle and I heard someone say, drop the weapon. He seemed like he was 10,000 feet tall. He was a, a grown police officer with his hand near his weapon. And for a split second, I thought, is he playing with me? But The look on his face told me he wasn't, and I was terrified, and I just froze. I just knelt down on the ground instinctively and closed my eyes and wished he would go away, and he eventually did. But you didn't tell anybody, right? Like, you you didn't tell anybody that this happened to you. Well, I was was ashamed of two things. I I was ashamed that I hadn't taken my mom seriously, and I was ashamed that I didn't do anything. When I was six, I thought I could have I could have stood up to him. I could have said, hey, it's just a water gun. But I didn't do anything. I just froze. 
not every black parent sits their child down and tells them about racism. And and in your case, it was your mother, but your mother's white. um, And she was the one who gave you the talk and not your black father. Like, what do you make of that or why that was the case? I learned what to make of it in the process of writing this book because, you know, I had to go back in time and try to get in touch with where my father was in life at the time. He had a six-year-old son, just like I had a six-year-old son. And maybe when he looked at me, he saw the same thing I see when I look at my son. And, you know, where I didn't want to take away my child's innocence, I think my father felt the same way. And he also was hoping that I wouldn't have to go through what he went through. Another interesting thing about the book, like you talk about dealing with microaggressions and being followed around stores, but it also seems like earlier in life and kind of like what you talked about, like you didn't want to stand out. And for you at that time, it seemed like it meant not focusing on race. How did you reach that conclusion as a young person? Like, oh, well, I, I'm just not going to make a big deal out of this race stuff. Well, as as a young person, I was I was trying to take my cues from my father. <laughs> he could just simply decide that it didn't bother him and he could just go about his business. And I got that from my dad. But every once in a while, you get a reminder, you get a rude Mm -hmm. reminder, a slap in the face telling you, no, no matter how you see yourself, this is how we see you. Can you talk about some of those moments, those reminders? It seems like in college you had a reminder with a professor that made you start thinking differently about how you were going to approach race. Up until that moment in college, I was young, so I was optimistic and I was giving everyone the benefit of the doubt. And I thought that racism was just a function of ignorance. And I thought that if I worked hard enough and if I accomplished enough, if I if I spoke well enough and if I got good enough grades, people who were racist would, you know, would realize that they were wrong. But then, you know, I... I found out that that's not the case. Even someone who who watches your progress, who grades your papers, who realizes that you're actually intelligent and you're, you know, ambitious, even that person might single you out and try to sabotage you. And I realized I should stop worrying about what the majority culture thinks of me. You know, I I should just live my life how I how I want to say what I want to talk about racism if I want to without fear of of them saying that I'm an angry black man. You know, if you could go back to yourself as that six year old boy and like give him a talk after that life altering encounter with the police officer, what would you say? I I would tell him don't pretend it didn't happen. And don't fault yourself for not stopping it because it was not in your power. You didn't do anything wrong and nothing you did provoked him. I, I think just knowing that would have, you know, w- would have changed everything for me. That's Darren Bell, Pulitzer Prize winner and author of a graphic novel, The Talk. Thank you so much for coming on the program. It was great. Thanks for having me. The following message comes from NPR sponsor, Mass Mutual. The Mass Mutual Foundation empowers local nonprofits to increase financial resilience in their communities. Board member Dorothy Varon explains why access to networks is key. One of the primary ways in which we think the work of the foundation can support that notion of mutuality is by supporting projects, organizations, who help us activate that connecting of people to not just the financial resources, but that can help groups of people learn about opportunities to be educated, to have networking opportunities they wouldn't otherwise have. It's all about getting people connected to the things that will help them break through barriers and avoid financial calamity in the event of a small financial hit. To learn more about the Mass Mutual Foundation and their community-led partnerships, visit MassMutual.com foundation.
Cartoonist Adele Rodriguez didn't speak English when he got to this country. It wasn't until middle school that he started reading in the language. And he told NPR Scott Simon that it was the books that he read then, you know, it was like Night and Animal Farm, that gave him the power, really, to write his graphic memoir, Worm, which is about his family fleeing Cuba. Adele Rodriguez has created more than 200 magazine covers for the likes of The New Yorker and Time magazine, Newsweek, and Der Spiegel. They are singular striking, and often controversial. His latest work is a graphic memoir that tells the story of his childhood in Cuba and his family's decision in 1980 to join a hazardous flotilla of refugees, the Marielle Boatlift. He uses his own life to capture what it's like to grow up under an authoritarian government and to sound a caution for the future. His book is called Worm, a Cuban-American odyssey, and Adele Rodriguez joins us from his studio in New Jersey. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Tell us about that little boy on the cover in a young pioneer's red cap. Um, well, uh, I think that boy was very adventurous. <laughs> this is you, um, right? Yeah, yeah, that's me. <laughs> um, this was a moment when, you know, I think when you're a child, when you get something like a uniform or something where you feel like you belong. That's what I wanted to picture on the cover, contrasted with the word worm right above him. And I think that that juxtaposition was a very strong image that I had in my mind from the very first moments that I started coming up with the story. Yeah, worm was was how the Cuban government derided people who wanted to leave, like your family, right? Yeah, I mean, at the time we kind of took it for granted because it was just said, so often, but then later on, when I uh, went after we had left, I, I came to realize that that's what um, uh, dictators and political figures uh, they find names to give uh, people that they disagree with to uh, dehumanize them. So, yeah. And let me ask you about the not just the shortages of food and other supplies with which you and your family grew up, but the fear. Your your mother, for example, would never mention El Jefe, I'll call Fidel Castro, by name. Yeah, I mean, the, the fear comes from the possibility that someone could be listening to you or listening to your conversation. And they tried to not talk about politics. And when they did, it was, it was done in a very quiet way, usually in a back room or in a place where neighbors wouldn't be listening in. I'm afraid I didn't know until reading this graphic novel... How cruel the conditions under which you and your family were held at a Cuban military base while you were waiting to leave. Can I get you to talk about that? Uh, we were in a detention camp for about a week in Cuba. Of course, it's not something that's uh, mentioned or spoken about by the Cuban government. In general, they don't really talk much about the, the Mariel boat lift. It, it, it's something that they'd rather forget. There's a lot of things that happen in Cuba that the rest of the world really doesn't know about because it's an island. Uh, they like to keep things um, quiet, but it's something that us Cubans have lived with uh, our whole life, the memories of the things that were done to us and what happened at these um, detention camps. You know, my mom was strip searched in front of me when we arrived there. All of her joy was taken from her. We were put in this camp with people that had just arrived from prison murderers, rapists, you know, prostitutes, uh, sort of all put into this this camp with family members. And we had to find a way to get along while we were there. Looking back, did you ever tell yourself, I'm going to tell this story someday? I think at the beginning, I, I was just trying to cope with being in a new country and figuring out how to how to deal with what my family had just went through. Later on, when I was maybe 18, 19, 20, that I, I started drawing and making pictures of my life or what influenced me, that a lot of these images started popping up. And eventually I, I came to think, well, this would make a fuller book. And that's what this is. I, I spent about eight to 10 years developing this book. Why did you want to do it at all? There are, are some people who live through terrible experiences who don't want to talk about them, much less put them between the pages of a book. Well, when I uh, when I arrived in this country, I, I didn't speak English at first. Eventually, I, I started reading and understanding English around sixth, seventh, eighth grade. And there was one book called Night uh, by Elie Wiesel. It, it, it made a very big impact on me when I was in my junior high school years. And it made me realize that you have to tell stories 
of, of things that have happened to you so that people learn from them and, and so that the same mistakes aren't repeated again. I wouldn't have known his story. I wouldn't have known so much about what happened in, in Germany or the Holocaust if it wasn't for that book and, and other books like 1984, uh, Animal Farm. Um, when I read those books, I felt like I was reading you know, my own story. <laughs> I felt it was important to put this down because this is my story, but th- this this has happened to hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. You uh, described growing up in, in Miami after coming to the United States and then going to, uh, to school in New York, art school. This is such a New York story. First person you met in New York was a fashion model? <laughs> yeah, on, on the airplane. Well, it happens to everybody coming to this country, doesn't it? Doesn't it? <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, I was a teenage boy, and I and I, I was just impressed that, that a, a model was even talking to me on the airplane, and then offered to show me the city and gave me her phone number without even asking. So, I, I of course, I arrived in New York and thinking, "Oh my God, this is an amazing place." <laughs> yeah, I want to ask you about some of the later chapters you take up your work. You cover, if I might put it that way, some of the most controversial covers, so to speak, that you've drawn. Do you refuse to draw Donald Trump's face? Well, yeah, that, there's a few reasons for that. I I, I don't enjoy necessarily drawing him. <laughs> so I found a way to do it as uh, detached as possible in a way. I, and I and also because I want people to focus more on the idea and the 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 concepts that I'm I'm trying to put out rather than his face or his, the way he looks. And and I'll, generally when you draw a figure with eyes looking at you, you sympathize with the figure perhaps. And I just wanted people to come in more and focus on what he was doing and what I'm saying about it. What concerns you about this moment in America, the country you love right now? When I arrived here, I was taught something about America and the people that lived here, this idea that welcoming immigrants it was a sort of a very important part of, of this country. The idea uh, that we had rights, you know, I never told I had rights in Cuba. And then when I arrived here, I first started studying social studies. The, the first thing that I focused on was this idea that I had, you know, rights and, and, and I could express myself. And I feel that Donald Trump is sort of chopping down all of these things that we have come to understand as to what America is, even just the freedom of the press. You know, the freedom of the press is very important to me because I didn't grow up with it. So when he calls the the press the enemy of the people, that reminds me of the type of thing that uh, Castro would say back in Cuba. Let me go back to the little boy in the red pioneer's cap on the cover. What would you tell him now? your young self? Um, I would say everything's going to be all right. <laughs> I always was very uh, cognizant of the fact that my parents had given up their entire life for my future and my, my sister's future. And uh, so I tried to grow up in a straight and narrow, not get in trouble, focus on my schooling and to kind of pay homage to my parents for what they did. And here I am with, with a book. <laughs> so uh, um, I would tell them it's going to be all right. Just keep doing what you're doing and, and um, you'll make your, your parents proud one day. Oh. Edil Rodriguez's new graphic novel, Worm. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you so much. And that's not it for this week. We're actually going to be giving you some bonus Saturday episodes for a while. So uh, check back in tomorrow. Bye. The Hunger Games is a blockbuster book and movie franchise. It's now spawned a prequel called The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. That's in theaters now. Prequels can be a mixed bag, so we're here to tell you whether this one's worth your time. Find out on the Pop Culture Happy Hour podcast from NPR. This message comes from NPR sponsor Monumental from PRX, a new weekly podcast that explores questions about the past, present, and future of U.S. monuments, uncovering the stories about what and who is important, as well as the stories that have been left out. Join host Ashley C. Ford across the country with their team of independent producers. Listen on Mondays, wherever you get your podcasts. 
This message comes from NPR sponsor Today Tix, with tickets to the best entertainment in New York City, including Broadway tickets up to 40% off. Book in advance or even day of. Get $20 off your first purchase with code NPR at todaytix.com.